Hello and welcome to The Sharpening. I am your host, Josh Peck. Tonight we have a special guest for you who has a book entitled The Shinar Directive, Preparing the Way for the Son of Perdition, which serves as a kingdom intelligence briefing for God's people in the 21st century. In this landmark book, Christians will discover the secret history of humanity that the Luciferian elite have hidden from the masses. Dr. Michael K. Lake holds doctorates in theology and religious education, and he is the chancellor and founder of Biblical Life College and Seminary. In 1995, Dr. Lake and his family found themselves in the crosshairs of an all-out attack from the occult community. During the spiritual conflict that lasted for over a decade, he turned his research skills toward understanding the occult, their hidden governance of the nations, their tactics for manipulating and controlling the church, the reality of mind control, and the Shinar Directive. More importantly, he discovered ancient Hebraic wisdom in the Word of God that can be utilized to discover and neutralize the occultist influence in the lives of believers today. So with all that being said, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to Michael K. Lake. Michael, how are you doing? I'm doing great, brother. How are you today? I am doing fantastic. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to come on the show and uh, talk with us about your book. It's uh, it's very exciting. It's, a, it's an interesting topic. Interesting topic, and I think one that believers are beginning to kind of wake up and realize, maybe I need to take a look at end-time prophecy again. Because uh, we're, we're actually, you can turn on the evening news and watch it unfold right before your very eyes. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And it, it seems the more that we're able to do that, the more the church as a whole, the majority of the church, kind of wants to shy away from these these topics, these prophetic topics. Uh, pretty much anything supernatural is is uh, kind of a, on, on the decline in the majority of the church. So it's really good to talk with uh, authors and researchers such as yourself who uh, understand the importance of prophecy and, and things like that. And you know, that's why I'm so excited about, about today's show. It's uh, it, it's a good thing. I, I want to ask for, for those who may not be familiar with you or your work, uh, would you be able to give us a rundown of your testimony, how you came to know Jesus, and how that led to what you do today? Actually, it started from the day that I was born. I was a preemie, and the doctor said that, in fact, it was three months that you could hold me in one hand. Uh, people that look at me now at 6'4", find it kind of, that's kind of hard to believe. But the doctors told my mother that uh, I wouldn't live through the night. And so she dedicated my life to the Lord uh, the night that I was born and pretty well kept the promise of keeping me in church my whole life. I can remember uh, this even as a toddler, just curling up underneath the pew and going to sleep while maybe some of the adults did it while sitting on the pews. But uh, spent my whole life in the church. I accepted Jesus when I was 12 at an old missionary Baptist youth camp way out. It nestled in the Ozarks. And on my 13th birthday, after running from God almost a year, I accepted the call to ministry. And I have been studying the Word and, and preaching the Word of God ever since. That's awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. I, I, I too, was born in a, born in the church. And, um, and you know, is it it Baptist. is it is pretty strict. But uh, it gave me the foundation I need to, you know, I needed to do what I do today. I just got to say, as kind of an offhand comment, uh, <laughs> your background puts mine to shame. <laughs> you, have, you, have, you can't even see the entire bookshelf. You have so many books, and then I have these two things. <laughs> well, I tell people my, when, I, when I develop my underground bunker, it's going to have a fully stocked library plus a fully stocked kitchen. <laughs> That's awesome, as well it should. Two very important things. Uh, but So let me ask, what, what, uh, what, why did you write the Shinar Directive? What, what led to that? For years I've kind of shied away from uh, teaching on, on end-time prophecy. You know, we all kind of got burned with, you know, 88 reasons Jesus was supposed to come back in 88, and 89 reasons he was supposed to come back in 89. And I had really for years just focused on just teaching people how to live the Word of God. Uh, but the last couple years, uh, God just began to move on me, and as I do seminars across the nation, I would bring up here, this is what I learned when the Illuminati were trying to kill me and what we learned about the occult, and, and here's how it, it plays out in the evening news, and you can begin to look at geopolitical politics and understand the dynamics. And as I begin to share this uh, at, at various seminars, uh, then we had, we had bishops, we had Christian educators, we had pastors, 
uh, most of them really they're, they're, we, we tend to be myopic many times in the body of Christ we're doing our little thing for Jesus and we're doing it just as hard as we can and these people were taken back at how I was being able to place uh, current events with end time prophecy and so it really began to I, I began to see the necessity of maybe taking some of the things that I had learned and some of the, the, the dots that I had connected and begin that conversation in a book that I could put in their hands that God could use to open their eyes and they could see how the elite are constantly manipulating us. Uh, I, I believe there is very little on the world stage that happens that is not that is not pre-planned and acted out from behind the scenes. Yeah, I would agree. The more that I look into this stuff, the more um, the the more apparent that truth becomes and you know that that's another thing about the majority of the church too is that a lot of them will would label uh people like you and I as uh conspiracy theorists or you know nut jobs or something like that like we need to go get our tin foil hats now we're going to be you know but uh but really you know at at its core this stuff is going on and it's it's even biblical uh, so why is the conspiratorial view of history, the only biblical view of history. When you when you sit down and you, you take a look at it, people think that there's you know, a, a multiplicity of views that we can have to world history, but there's really only two. One is accidental history, that everything that happens just happens by accident, and that there's no connection, there was no planning or anything. And the only other view is conspiratorial. Now when you understand, you know, I, I used to, I'm ex-military, and so I, I did pick up a few things along the way that governments, we have the CIA that is pitted like let's say with Russia with the KGB and there's this, there's this game of thrones that constantly goes on of they're planning against us, we're planning against them, we're trying to hide what we're doing, they're trying to hide what they're doing. Uh, all of that, all of this type of, of game of thrones actually originates out of the occult which goes on since, uh, since Babylon and so to not think that that is going on is really to live life in, in a naive state. Right, I, I I couldn't agree more, and I mean it's happening more and more and more exponentially. Uh, I mean I I never even heard the term false flag until just a few years ago, and now we see it everywhere. Um, I, you know I I I'm curious what your litmus test is. Like how how do we tell the the real information from the misinformation? What 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 type of discernment or how, what, what's your what's your process? Number one, I spend a lot of time in prayer as I, as I weed through things. And you have to start with some of the things that you know are true, then you'll begin looking for connecting dots. Because one of the things of, in, of intelligence, uh, when, you, when you're active in the intelligence community per se, is you also set out disinformation to hide what you're doing. But what I look for is consistent things that, that also fall in line with some of the agendas that we have already kind of discovered that are going on. And as you do, you just sit down and say, okay, now... If, if, this is, if this is really what I'm seeing here, then the, the possible direction they would take would be A, B, or C. And you can sit and begin to watch it unfold all the time. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, and there, there are those that, that are doing that, and, and, uh, which, which is good because, you know, we all, need to, we all need to be informed. And, and you know, e even though it seems like, even though it is growing exponentially, this isn't really like a new, you know, a new thing that's going on. This has been going on. Uh, really, since the garden, hasn't it? Um, how how, uh, how how do you see both Jesus and Lucifer found in, in Genesis one through three? When you look in Genesis one, I love taking apart the Hebrew. Uh, one uh, rabbinical teacher got my attention years ago when when I, I was reading one of his quotes, and he said that if you really understood Hebrew, it would take you a lifetime just to ferret out everything that's in Genesis one one through three. Wow! And uh, I find that to be so. Um, I, I believe in, in, you know, I, I know some people out there don't believe in the gap theory between Genesis 1 and 1, 2. I do. I think that's where Lucifer fell. Okay. And, and that's also where the rebellion went. It, it caused an upheaval upon the earth, and God had to remake the earth. Um, so you see Lucifer's activities in that because he always comes to bring chaos. The world did not begin in a chaotic state. Because the Bible says God is not a God of chaos. He's, he's not a God of, 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 of darkness. In fact, the uh, Hebrew word, I believe it is, is uh, tahu or tavu, I, kind of going off the top of my head instead of notes. But it, it talked about how it became void. Well, in Isaiah, 
it, Isaiah actually uses the exact same word in Genesis 1-2. He said God did not create the world to be void. Mm -hmm. So there had to be something there happen. But we, so we see Lucifer there, but in Genesis 1-1, I've, I've always heard so many arguments when you look at uh, 1 John or John chapter 1 where it says in the, in the beginning was, was the word, and they try to connect us into Greek philosophy somehow or another. What we don't understand is that there was the, the rabbis believe that every single Hebrew letter is in sequence, especially in, in the Torah, because it was dictated by God to Moses. Moses didn't just write it and inspire it. He was nothing more than God's glorified secretary. God spoke it word for word, so there's a special anointing on it. And right next to Elohim, in the beginning, there was this little word, the Olive Tav, that the rabbis were trying to figure out who he was. Oh, wow. And they had debated this for centuries. And then you have, and so John begins to get this revelation, and Jesus actually confirms the revelation because he writes the Gospel of John before he writes the book of Revelation. When Jesus came to him and said, I'm the Alpha and Omega, these were two Jewish boys, if you will. They're not sitting there talking Greek to one another. Right. Uh, this Jewish Lord came to his Jewish apostle and said, I'm the Olive Tav. It's like, yes, I had it right, Lord. And so the Olive Tav is in the beginning of creation, and why was he separate from Elohim? It's because he had, a, he had a distinct work of redemption as a part of the Godhead. But he's there in the very beginning. And you'll find him all throughout Scripture, especially in Messianic verses. Uh, one of the most famous is one day we know when Jesus comes back, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. In the mm -hmm. Hebrew, it literally reads, they will look upon the olive tab they have pierced. So Jesus was in the beginning, so was, so was Lucifer in the, in the effects that we see of his chaos upon the earth, but they're also both in the garden. Which is, which is really exciting. Um, there, I, I think since we've been disenfranchised from a Hebraic heritage, we, we read over things and we really don't get it. Right. When you, when you read the creation story, it's Elohim created, Elohim created, Elohim created. The moment he created man, he introduced himself by a hyphenated name. He became Yahweh Elohim. That's the first time it's mentioned. And what's so cool is in the garden, the serpent didn't know him by Yahweh Elohim. He only knew him by Elohim. He says, has not Elohim said? And one of the things the rabbis teach is that Yahweh represents the mercy of God, where Elohim represents the justice of God. And so God, when he made man, he knew what was going to happen, so he balanced out mercy and justice together. And even in the, in the Tetragrammaton, we can, when you look at yod heid vav Hey, it can be literally translated, the God with the nailed hand shall be, will, be, will be revealed twice. Wow. And so the, the first time Jesus came as Yahweh, because he came to give mercy, he did not come to judge, he was Messiah ben Joseph. But the second time he comes, he'll come as Elohim, because he'll come as Messiah ben David to judge the earth. It's all encoded right there in, in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, one, one of the one of the most uh, beneficial things that I I was taught years ago was how to go back into the original languages of uh, Hebrew and Greek. And you know, I, I I find it really interesting what you mentioned about the Tetragrammaton because isn't something like that found in uh, in Jesus in the name of Yeshua? Uh, I believe if I I'm going off memory, but I believe it's something like uh, the hand that destroys the establishment of the eye or something like that. Yeah, you're right on the money. Because it, it, it's it, Yahweh being revealed as Yeshua is even encoded into the Psalms, where it literally says that Yahweh shall become our Yeshua. Wow! So, I mean, God is just spelling it out for us for us to be able to follow the breadcrumbs throughout the Word of God. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, something else you talk about in your book is. Um, Lucifer's anointing. Uh, how, how can uh, how do we properly understand that? What, what what exactly is that, and how does it how does it contrast to the anointing of Jesus? Well, I think for the first thing we need to understand, it, it, it seems like in most churches they believe that everything that's anointed is of God, and that's not true. That that Satan or Lucifer was the anointed cherub that covers, which means he has an anointing. But he also has the ability to, manif to, to rest right on top of the manifested presence of God. In heaven, he was the canopy over the very throne of God. And, you know, God's throne is the only place in the universe where he doesn't hold anything back and he just releases his, the fullness of his presence. And Lucifer, before his fall, had the anointing to rest immediately on that. And I think a lot of the things that we're seeing, uh, especially in the charismatic movement as of late, is not God's anointing, 
it's Lucifer's anointing moving. And, and I, I see ministers, many times they will use uh, certain key phrases or something that comes right out of out of esoteric teachings, and they're trying to uh, portray that through the pulpit and say it, it refers back to the Word of God. Uh, I also found that uh, we, it's a phenomenon we call the double stream, and, and if you've ever been in, in churches where they move in the gifts, you'll have this, you'll have a guy that's preaching real good, or he's, I mean, really under the anointing, and then all of a sudden, his, his sermon goes south, his prophetic word goes south, and you're thinking, what just happened? Well, that was there was a wound or something in his life that he did not have covered by the blood of Jesus, and that, that secondary anointing piggybacked right on top of that to contaminate what God was doing. Uh, from the either from the pulpit or, or within the gifts of the Spirit. That's why it's so important to keep everything in our lives under the blood of Jesus and to really walk sanctified before the Lord. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, and we we see that a lot. And I mean, it's amazing how far downhill um, a lot of these charismatic churches have gone. I mean, even to the point of necromancy and and uh, the, the, this, well, it's not exactly new now, but this uh, this grave-sucking thing where they will go to the graves of, uh, of you know, spiritually enlightened people or whatever from the, from their church and they'll try to get get an anointing from the from the grave. I mean, it's it's crazy. If if that's not a cult, what is? <laughs> uh, when when we don't really have our, you know, the foundation has to be the word of God. If if you can't see it being done by Jesus, the apostles, if you can't see Elijah, Elisha doing it, if you can't see Moses doing it, how about let's just not do it? I couldn't agree more exactly. Um, and I, I, I'm curious, what what are your interpretation of uh, of the gifts? Because you know, throughout the church, we have kind of uh, two extremes. There, there's one side of the church that'll say, well, we just don't have to pay attention to them, basically. But then there's like the other side of the church that, like the charismatic, that makes it into this big spectacle and more of a show than really anything else. What? How how do we tell what's what's real, what's of God, what's not? What 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 are your what, what's your interpretation of of how those gifts uh, should look in in a uh, Christian life today? I think we it, it it doesn't need to be a show. You can actually give somebody a prophetic word and not say, "Thus saith the Lord." I mean, you you don't need to make it into a spectacle. Uh, I you know I, I I like some of the old preachers. I, I read Spurgeon, and Spurgeon moved in the gifts of the Holy Spirit while he was while he was preaching. In fact, uh, there's one sermon in particular that he has a word of knowledge for a man. He said, listen, uh, there, was, there was a man in this church and, and he owns a shoe shop and he didn't go to church last week because he wanted to, he wanted to open up a store uh, to sell. And so last week you sold one set of shoes, so you sold your soul to the devil last week for, for six pence or whatever it was. That's a prophetic word. And it brought the man to repentance. Anytime wow. that there is a true manifestation of, of the Holy Spirit, number one, there will be a humility in the individual. It will always point to Christ, and it will have positive fruit in their lives. And by the way, that positive fruit is not an offering. That positive fruit is those people repenting, getting right with God, God restoring their bodies, something to bring them closer to God, to bring healing, and to bring them back in line with the kingdom of God. Yeah, absolutely. You know, as it says, you'll know them by their fruit. And, um, you know, it's really interesting, too, like how I, I've been in churches, you know, not not really of my own, you know, of my own choice or choose, but, you know, I've been invited to churches and I'd go check them out. And, so, you know, some of these churches, these these really super charismatic ones, if I know ahead of time that it's going to be that, I, I you know, I'll politely decline the offer but you know sometimes you get a friend that's like well you want to want to come to church with me yeah sure I'll check it out and um, in a lot of these churches that I've been to there will be this uh, this time that they call you know worship service where uh, it's not typically what you know you would think worship is it's it's really more of a mosh pit than anything else <laughs> and I, I remember the first time that I saw that I I couldn't believe it, and it wasn't even really like the speaking in tongues or anything that bothered me. It, it, it wasn't that at all, because I, I mean, you know, that that's. But uh, what what was upsetting is regard. Well, you know, when we look at what Paul wrote, regardless of what, like for example, the uh, interpretation of tongues and speaking in tongues, regardless what one's own interpretation of what that means actually is. Uh, 
you know, Paul said not to do that in the church. It's it's better to, to prophesy because, you know, that's something that actually has some proof to it. That's something that can cause somebody to fall down and worship God if you're t revealing the secrets of their heart and all that. Speaking in tongues, if... Um, you know, if somebody comes in, you'll you look like a lunatic. And I, when I when I went to a church that was really, you know, in, into that, into doing that in the church service and call it worship and throwing themselves around and, you know, basically like shaking on the floor, foaming at the mouth kind of stuff, I, you know, I had to wonder, how is this bringing glory to God? Like, how can you call this, how can you call this worship? I, I never remember reading anything of Jesus doing stuff like this. <laughs> You know, I, I, I came into the, because for years I was part of the charismatic movement. I uh, was baptized in the Holy Spirit at 16 after I fought God for about a year and a half theologically. And I found out any time you fight God theologically, you're never going to win. Um, but in, in the, in the, whenever the Spirit of God is really moving, now there's, there's things of the flesh, and there's also demonic and a lot of other things, and sometimes it's just culture that people build within churches. Um, anytime the Spirit of God moves, there's a grace with that moving. Yeah, uh, I, I've been in services to where there was spontaneous people uh, praying and worshiping in tongues, and there there was a beauty to it. And I've seen too where it's just more like a mosh pit, and you want to kind of walk out of the church and say, "Okay, Lord, uh, I think I'll try somewhere else next week." But when when the gifts of the Holy Spirit are really moving, uh, there's just a grace, there's a beauty to it. it. It's lifting up Jesus. It isn't lifting up the flesh. That's and, right. I think we're going to need these in the last days because we're going to begin having occultic people moving in satanic power. Yeah. And so you're going to need to know your authority in Christ. You're going to need to know the name of the power, the name of Jesus and the power of the blood and how to hear from God. And and uh, sometimes the only way that God can uh, overcome a, a witchcraft spell or, or hex or something is to have somebody release a prophetic anointing to speak out against it. And so I think, I think we're going to have to come to a place of maturity uh, and, and just let the grace of God work on us to we're walking with God according to what He says in His Word to do, not necessarily our culture, not necessarily some of the things that we learned in church. Because I think some of these behaviors we learn because everybody else is doing it, you get saved in that church and you begin mimicking the same behavior. But really, it, it's, it's going back and saying, listen, Holy Spirit, I want you to use me because even the root word of, for, for the gifts of the Holy Spirit, uh, charismata, is, is charis, it's grace. It's a deposit of God's grace. And if it's going to be a deposit of God's grace, there's going to be a gracefulness to it. There always will be. Absolutely, and I, I, you know, I can even attest to that uh, personally because the the few times in my life that I've actually been around uh, the gifts when they've been used as they're you know supposed to be used, it is it's peaceful, it's graceful. You don't feel uncomfortable, you know. It's not uh, something where it's like you're wondering, uh, is there something a little off here? You know, I, I got to get out of here. This is loud, or you know, nothing like that. It's it's uh, uh, it it. it it really brings up a feeling of love, um, and I've I've only really, um, you know, I mean I'm fortunate I'm I'm happy for the times that I have been in that, but unfortunately it's only been a handful of times in my entire life, uh, and I, I think that you know a lot of the church is is afraid of that in, in one of two ways either they're afraid to touch it because they see what the really out there you know care and I'm not saying all charismatics are out there but the the ones that are really out there they see that they think that's what you know what it is they don't want anything to do with it and then the the more out there you know charismatics or you know whatever will see the other side of the church just flat out ignoring them and saying that the gifts died with the apostles and all this stuff and so it creates this division uh, which is unfortunate because somewhere in the middle there really is uh, truth there and it and I, I couldn't agree more it's something that you know with, with what you said it, it's something that we do need to learn in these in these last days it's a very big part of spiritual warfare which is another um, another topic that the majority of the church uh, will ignore um, it, it really seems to you know there there are a few churches in the middle that that will handle things like possession or demonic oppression or things like that uh, but usually it's either ignored or it's made into a show and you know I think it's hard for people to in, in either case people that are trying to look at it objectively to be able to really take it seriously even though this is something that's talked about in the Bible you know all, all over the place 
Uh, and uh, so I, I think, you know, I think we need to get back to that. that, that we need to understand spiritual warfare, that these things are real, and that the enemy, they they have knowledge. You know, they know how to come at us if they want. We need to know how to protect ourselves. Uh, that, that actually brings up an interesting point, too, that, that you make in your book. And, uh, you know, I wanted to ask, how, how was esoteric knowledge um, a, a stowaway on the Ark? How, how, did that get, how did that get brought from the antediluvian world into, uh, into the post-flood Earth? You know, now Moses, or, uh, not Moses, Noah was a righteous man, and we know that. But the Word of God also says that uh, his DNA was pure in, in the terminology it uses in the Hebrew. Uh, but there, there was something about Ham that you know we don't know necessarily what Ham's activities were. And, and in fact, Rob Skeeb and I were kind of joking. He may have went down to Watch or You University to to get, to get some things before <laughs> uh, you know during the break of, of you know building the ark. But he carried something on the inside of his heart that began to manifest uh, immediately after uh, after they got out of the ark. That uh, you have the incident where uh, he left his father's nakedness uncovered, and then his son Cain was involved. But you also begin to see through his line that uh, it, w it was through his line that uh, one of his uh, I think it was one of his grandsons uh, became Mizraim that founded Egypt. Cush helped Nimrod begin to found Babylon, and so it became a family business of of uh, of taking this knowledge and begin doing something to war against God with it. And what I have always found, anybody who begins getting in, into esotericism, uh, getting into the occult where they think they're moving in the secret knowledge, the first thing they get is very arrogant. And you, you see that with Ham, and, and instead of him doing like his brothers and and trying to show respect to his father, he couldn't wait to show everybody what had happened, and there, there was an arrogance that's always a manifestation uh, that when you begin getting into these things, you begin lifting up in pride just like the one you're connected to, which is Lucifer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and the few people that I've known who uh, will practice things like Gnosticism, you know, I, I, I've, I've had friends uh, who, you know, they, they were brothers and sisters in Christ, and they... Uh, it, 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 it's interesting how it always seems to connect uh, a lot of times with this ancient astronaut theory thing, but they'll watch ancient aliens or something like that, and then uh, somehow they, they go from that to uh, getting into the Gnostic uh, teachings and end up denying Christ through it, it you know, without exactly realize. I mean, they should realize that's what they're doing, but without it, it, it gives them this new definition of who Christ was that I guess they find more appealing for some reason, but I've noticed that too, that that's the first thing to change is there's um, there's a sense of entitlement and, uh, and, and arrogance. The, the Gnosticism they're getting into, and this may be my next book, I'm, I'm kind of contemplating writing the next one, calling it The Watcher Files, but when you when you look at what the Watchers did, and even the the information that uh, Ham may have carried on the Ark with him, uh, almost every civilization on the planet goes back to things, and you can look at not only in reference to it in the Bible, but you can look in, into uh, all the mythologies and how they go back. That that these visitors, whether they were angels or they classified them as gods or astronauts or whatever you want to call it, they begin to develop all society based upon what those angels taught them. And it and so it, it exploded in Babylon, in Egypt, in Greece, in Syria, and and so it's encoded, and that's where Gnostics draw from, and just how much of our society today is actually drawn from what you're teaching is is once you once you begin understanding these principles, it, it's almost mind-boggling. The only anti-watcher culture that exists is a culture God developed in in, in the Word of God. That he began to lay down the foundation in the Torah and begin to expand from that. It was it was saying, listen, this is clean, this is unclean. This is how you tell what's watchers. This is how you tell what's kingdom of God. This is how you tell the two kingdoms apart. And as we begin, and as we get started getting back into the Bible, and actually reading the whole book from Genesis to Revelation, we begin to see what what's really of God and what's really not of God, so that we can begin separating these things out and understanding the war that we're in. Yeah, and we absolutely are in a war. That 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 actually was the topic of my the very first book I ever wrote, Disclosure. Uh, we we are in a, a secret war of the ancients, and most of the time, most uh you know most of the population doesn't realize it. And 
as I as I say in that book, I think that's where uh, the enemy uses those people best. You know, they're they're kind of like prisoners of war, um, and, and even uh, even the ones that get into this, you know, I, I I believe that there are very few that actually know uh, what's really going on. You know, there's um, there's some in the church, and then there's some in the camps of the enemy. You know, the elite, the illuminated. Uh, I mean, and, and even in a sense, they. You know, they think they know. They 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 they're following what their leader is is telling them. Uh, you know, they see Yahweh as the bad guy and all that. Uh, so I guess in that sense, they don't even they don't really know. But they're at least more aware of the war than uh, most people on Earth are. Uh, yet this war it affects it affects everything everybody does, how we live our lives, all and not just here in America, but all all across the globe. Um, th this is a. Uh, this is a, a question that kind of popped into my head as as you were speaking. Uh, go, going back to the the knowledge of the Watchers, do you think this has anything to do with what's recorded in uh, Josephus and Jubilees about the um, the tablets of the children of Seth? I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. Uh, I'm I'm sure you are. Do you, do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Vaguely, I don't, I don't think I went in that direction with uh, with my with my studies. But that's something oh, okay. to look into now. <laughs> Yeah, it's it, it was it, you know it's just it's a uh, it's a curiosity I guess. Uh, Josephus and uh, Jubilees kind of you know when you put them together it tells the story of uh, of these tablets that were uh, or, or these pillars excuse me that were uh, that were made prior to the flood um, and well it's a whole thing I don't want to get I don't want to get too sidetracked uh, but it, it's it, it's interesting nonetheless. But um, so how did these how did how did these mystery religions start? Was it a pre-flood thing? Did, did it come straight from the Watchers? And and if so, how how did it progress throughout history? It it started with the Watchers. I believe it was carried over by Ham, uh, and they began developing civilizations around it. Uh, I think that they were, in a sense, very overt at first until God began to judge a lot of things. Uh, Nimrod ended up getting killed over what he was doing uh, after the Tower of Babel. And that's when it began to go occult. So they would they would hide certain things, or they would layer them. That whenever you look at an occultic symbol, there's there's at least three different interpretations, and there may be more beyond that. This depends. They'll they'll tell somebody that's a newbie, well, this is what it means. But you know, it's like sun worship. These guys in in old they didn't they didn't actually worship you know a big burning ball of gas. Uh, you know, out of, out in the universe, they that that represented illumination. And so they were representing the power behind the illumination that was represented by the sun. Uh, but you had to go two or three levels down before you really understood what they were really doing. That's why most Masons today don't understand what's going on with uh, with their own lodges. If they, you know, they're, they're, when they get to a certain degree, they're handed this huge book called Morals and Dogma. And if they would take time to read it, they're told directly in that book that they are lied to about what all the symbolism means. And only when you progress and really study and and get to the higher levels. Do you ever discover what the real meaning of what the lodge and all their symbols are about? That's that's how that un, uh, unfolds. Uh, and once you begin realizing the symbols, uh, it doesn't matter if you look at Washington D.C. Doesn't matter if you look at the Vatican or, or many other areas around the world. You begin to see the elements of esoteric knowledge interwoven into the symbolism that they use. Wow. Yeah, you know, I. I... I'm curious what you think about that. Why why do they do that? Why do they veil things in in uh, symbols that are for everybody to see? You know, it it seems like if they want to be so secret, why don't they just stay secret and not put their stuff out there? Or if they want it out there, why don't they just put it out there for everyone to see? What what what's what's the what, what's really going on with their their process for 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 doing that doing it that way? I think part of the process, you know, it, it's it's you we can reverse this. It's like when you first get saved. The, the process of sanctification, you know, God God doesn't want to show you the absolute mess that you're in when you first get saved. He shows you you're a sinner, you need me, you're going to hell without me, you get saved, and you start getting into the Word and say, oh, dear Lord, I was doing that wrong, I was doing that wrong, I, I, I need an adjustment here, I need an adjustment there. And ten years down the road, you look at what you used to be, and it's almost like you're looking at the life of a stranger. Right. You, you, re you reverse that. And deception comes in slowly. 
they, they have they, there, there's a process they go through that's supposed to be a spiritual awakening but what it does in the process of learning all these things is it slowly begins to darken your mind and change the change your very personality and character into something that is prepared for really what the end game is and it's not until you get to those last levels do you really realize uh, what they're about but your heart has already been prepared to embrace those things so that you won't reveal their secrets Oh, okay, that makes sense. Um, you know, Nimrod is a really interesting character. It's somebody that I, you know, I've, I've wrote about, and I know a lot of other researchers who've written about Nimrod as well. And, you know, what, what's so interesting about him is not, not a whole lot, on the surface, it would seem, not a whole lot is really uh, revealed in the Bible about him. But when you go back into the Hebrew and stuff, there's there is a lot there. Um, what... What is Nimrod's role in all of this? What what did uh what, what kind of person was he? What did he what did he do? How, how did because a lot of these uh you know occultists and secret societies and stuff they 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 trace their origins back to Nimrod and you know they're pr proud of that. What was Nimrod's whole uh, role in 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 what we're talking about here? When you read in the Hebrew in, in Genesis ten eight you know in, in the English you read and Cush begat Nimrod and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. And you read that in English and you go, okay, so he used to he became a tough guy. No biggie, let's just go on, turn the page. In the Hebrew, uh, the word for began there is halal, which means that he profaned himself, he defiled himself, he prostituted himself, that he did something uh, that altered who he was. In fact, the Septuagint, because the mighty ones there is giborim, and when you look at the principle of first mention in interpreting the Bible, the first time that that word is used is when the in Genesis 6, when the angels came down and began to cohabit with women, that those Nephilim began, began to be men of renown. They began to be considered gibberim. And so the idea, when you look at the principle of first mission, it was their mighty deeds, their supernatural strength, their cunning, uh, their veracity, whatever you want to add into uh, that equation, uh, that became associated with Gibberim. Uh, that's why later on even David's men were called Gibberim because they would do mighty exploits. Uh, within mythology, you have they would consider Hercules a Gibberim. And so the second time it's mentioned in the Bible is with Nimrod. Uh, in fact, the Septuagint literally translates it, and Nimrod began to be a giant. Wow, yeah. And so there, there was something that he did, which is really what, what, the, what esotericism is about. They're, they're trying to become godlike, and they look at all these, these Nephilim, the Gibberim, the Raphaim. They, they look at them and said, these became demigods on the earth, and that's what we want to become. And Nimrod did it differently. Uh, when you look at the Genesis 6 experiments, I believe most of those things they did, they either did through the act of sex or, or through genetic modification that was done in vitro, if you will. But here you have a full-grown man that all of a sudden he is able to do something with his DNA and how he did that we don't know whatever it was occultic workings or what and it hasn't really been able to be replicated since. That's why he's still their hero. They're, they're trying to figure it out. He was able to transmute himself to become a gibberim or, or to become a Nephilim or to become a giant. Uh, you, you see that in all esotericism, they're trying to turn these things on. Uh, in, in fact, with, with alchemy, uh, turning lead into gold is a metaphor for turning a man into a god, which is exactly what transhumanism is wanting to do today. And so uh, all the things that we see going on in the earth today, uh, that uh, in, in, in fact the, the elite believe they're no longer human. That they're, that oh, they're, wow. They believe that they're part Nephilim or, or Gibberim or whatever, and that's they're, they're trying to uh, evolve themselves in, into becoming godlike. And so they look at us more like cattle than, than anything else. And also when you look at this word, I, I, I didn't really notice this until this last week. I wish I would have put this in the book. But when you look later on at that halal in Hebrew, it also means to wound fatally, to bore through, to pierce, uh, or, or to be uh, severely wounded. And it's almost like in that very word is the type and shadow of the Antichrist. The Antichrist is going to be a man until he has this severe wound in his head. And somehow or another, he's resurrected and brought back to life. And when he is, he's a gibberim. Wow. Son of perdition. That you see this in the original word began that, that we find with, with Nimrod in the book of Genesis. 
Wow, yeah. Uh, you know, what's interesting, too, is when, um, <clears throat> and I, I don't have the uh, Hebrew right in front of me, but uh, when it talks about how the, the people in, in Shinar, they were of one speech and one language, I remember when I when I first read that just in English, I was like, well, that's weird. That sounds like it's saying the same thing. When you look into the in, into the Hebrew, it, it, it seems to, it, uh, from what I, what I can <laughs> put together, it seems like it's talking about... Um, one thought process or, or one one belief system. I mean, it, it, it's almost like they had, like they were drones or something. Uh, it was kind of how I, I I thought of it. Almost a supernatural hive mentality, and really, when you when you look at what the elite are doing today across all the uh, various spectrums within within society, uh, that's where they're trying to get us. Uh, they're trying to get us to be drones that we simply do their tasks. Uh, I believe when I'm looking at things, I think that they control all governments, not just the United States. I think they control them all. That that uh, in, in this dichotomy of, of us facing Russia or us facing the war on terror, there's technologies and certain things that are being developed on both sides. But the truth is they wanted those developed because sometimes in the state of war is when you get some of the greatest technologies like the atomic bomb and, and many other things. And so when they're developed, they have access to everything Russia developed to come against us as well as everything we developed to go against Russia. And so there's this arms race going on, this technology race, but they have access to both sides so they can utilize it for their purposes. Wow, that makes a lot of sense. And, and yeah, it, you know, back in Nimrod's day, it seems like there was a type of, uh, you know, mind control going on and um, definitely a lot of lies being told. And and it seems like the same thing is, is going on today. Uh, you know, we, you know, like we hear in America, we'll, we'll hear of a war or a rumor of war, to use uh, Jesus' words. And... Um, we just think that it's what is being reported. We don't really question it. We just kind of go along with it. Yet we don't really, we don't really even consider what could be going on behind the curtain with with what you were talking about. Uh, do, do you see that as a type of mind control, or, or what what exactly is mind control like in our in our modern world? Well, I, I think probably most of your viewers are are familiar with MK Ultra. Uh, and, and the Monarch Project and all that where they use trauma-based mind control where they would split the mind. Uh, one of the things I show evidence in, in my book, and I mean you can find some of this information just really easy on Wikipedia, uh, that they have moved beyond that, that they can do electronic induction without actually having to uh, do trauma to split the mind. I think maybe some occult, a lot of cult groups out that are out there are still using the old techniques because they're not privy to some of the new things that have been developed by our government and other governments. Uh, and so we, we have that going on. But if you realize that, uh, j look how much that America has changed since the 1950s. And the primary force to create that change was a little thing called television. Right. And what's, you know, and it, 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 it really gets to be a, a rabbit hole when you begin to jump down this thing because the Nazis developed television. But the cathode ray, tru uh, the cathode ray tube that they uh, used to develop television goes all the way back to the esoteric group, I don't, I don't know, the, the, the Golden Dawn, that they actually developed the, the cathode troop to try to talk to the other side, if you will. Uh, and so there's, there's an esoteric, uh, occultic conspiracy behind the, even the development of television. But we have found that when you're watching TV, uh, if you do it in a passive state where you just, I'm going to go be entertained and I'm not really guarding my mind, that within just a couple of minutes you go into an alpha state. It, it's, it's almost a hypnotic state, and the, the logic centers of your brain that help you filter and, and, and make decisions, is this right, is this wrong, is this really truth, all those things shut down. And so while you're laughing at your favorite comedy, as you're being uh, mesmerized by all the special effects in the latest action movie, they have been subtly reprogramming us and changing our culture. And a lot of the things, the church is waking up to the fact of just how much culture has changed. They use TV as the program media, if you will literally call it programming, in the wow. industry. They use that programming to program a new generation. And uh, they even go beyond that, uh, talking or listening to um, Dr. Bigich. And in fact, I was able to get him to confirm this, that in, uh, in the 90s, he was on a television show in Canada 
and they have developed a, a signal that they can put, whether it's through computer, through your smartphone, uh, through television, radio, that becomes the voice of God on the inside of your head that becomes irresistible. That they've gotten that far in the technology, and, and we think that, well, you know, we still got plenty of time, uh, that we don't need to cover our minds. The helmet of salvation becomes really critical. Uh, the blood yeah. of Jesus becomes really critical in the days ahead. And, and, it, and we can take authority over these things and shut them down. If you ever start, just, just do this as an experiment. Refuse to get in entertainment mode. Set in your heart to be in analytical mode. And plead the blood of Jesus between you and the evening news. You do that for a couple of nights and you're going to start catching the lies and start yelling at your television before, it's, before you're through. Yeah, uh, that, that, that was actually something that I, I noticed when I first started getting into all this type of research a few years ago. Because before I got into doing everything I'm doing now, I was probably the biggest couch potato in the world. You know, I um, I have a rare bone disease, so I, I've been on disability. Uh, so that gave me an excuse. It, you know, in in my mind, I really wasn't I wasn't doing much for God or anything. And I I, I would just sit down and watch TV all day. I I would get my uh, you know government check for being disabled, and that was basically how I lived out every day. Um, and it was it was very very unfulfilling, and I you know I, I thank God every day that he, he got me out of that. But one of the first things that I realized in uh in in coming into this this type of research was how much we're being manipulated through the entertainment industry, and uh you, you know I, I started to see it little by little, but it you know my eyes were being opened exponentially, and uh and, and now I. I, I don't ever really watch the news, or you know, if I if I if I'm going to get any kind of news, I, I I have to get it from a lot of different sources to try to do my best to piece together what actually happened, and even then, you, you know, even then, you you there's no way to know for sure. Um, but yeah, exactly like you said, you <laughs> you find yourself yelling at the TV because it's it's so ridiculous that when when you see it for what it is, it's it's so ridiculous to think that wow, they're they are deceiving an entire nation, really an entire world, because uh, it's not just America that this is happening. Um, and it, it, you know, coming to that realization can kind of be a uh, put you in kind of a, a lonely state. But it's good that there are other people out there that, <laughs> that see it too, like like yourself. Now, so when you realize that there's a writers' guild that no commercial, no television programming, not even the late night talk shows can have a script if it's not written by a member of that guild. And so, I mean, you could actually, let's say, let's say you wrote um, a script for an awesome movie. Then it has to be handed over to the Writers Guild and they begin unfolding everything of their agenda into that movie that was never in your original manuscript. And that is happening time and time again. And it's gotten to the place to where it doesn't even belong in the movie. Right. But yet it's there. And I even think that nudity and the sexuality that they add in the movie is because when you visually see these things, it opens up parts of your brain so they can slip in programming with. Wow. So what, what kinds of things are they, uh, are they trying to put in people's minds? Like what kind of programming or messages? Like what's their, uh, what, what, what are they trying to get across to everybody? Well, I think one of the first one we've seen in the last ten years is the new sexual agenda. That they had, you know, and, and over several decades they have taken us from a leave it to beaver agenda, you know, for what a family is, the basic nuclear family, you know, uh, you know the old song of you know man was created to love a woman, a woman was loved well, to create a man. Well, that's hate speech anymore, right? Because they they have so redefined everything, and then you have impressionable youth that all it takes is if it becomes popular they'll do it doesn't matter what it is and they'll, they'll go for it they'll, they'll rebel against what the last generation was and so I think they have been doing that in many areas uh, they have been getting us uh, you know it, it's hard to be politically dead center anymore because they keep on moving the middle right uh, what we consider middle ground politically now used to be far left they had to create. They've actually had to create a new part of the field just so that they could have their left right now because they'd be they would be out of the parking lot sitting in Denny's. They're so far left, and they have us thinking that the parking lot is now center, 
and that anybody that's just a little bit to the right of that is radical when when you go back you know a hundred years uh, the, are the most conservative person that we have would be considered a liberal today yeah yeah it's it's amazing how much the the world is changing I, I remember when the whole um, the whole thing with chick-fil-a w was happening and I I uh, I first, you know, saw the news reports and it, it made it out to seem like it like they were all full of, you know, the whole corporation was full of these hateful bigots that were, you know, just uh, condemning the gay community and all, all this stuff. And then when you get at the truth of it, the only thing they really said was we support a traditional marriage, you know, we support a traditional family, something along those lines. They didn't even say anything, you know, about about like gay people or anything like that but that all got added in in the in the in the media when that when that blew up you can't say um, I support a traditional family or a traditional marriage anymore without it without it like you said without it being hate speech yet it's celebrated if if somebody says oh I celebrate a or, or I um, you know, I, I support uh, gay marriage or, or something like that, then that's celebrated. But if you support traditional, you're a bigot and you're hateful and, and all. It's And it's all, the really ironic thing is it's all in the name of tolerance. <laughs> Yet, they don't want to be tolerant of us, do they? <laughs> you know, there, there's a quote by Rosh Dooney in, in his, one of his volumes, I think it was volume one, on understanding biblical law. And he said, any time that you see in history them beginning to call for tolerance, is so that this, so that they can establish the new intolerance. Mm. And uh, he wrote that years ago, and and it has it has definitely proven itself up to be true. Wow. Yeah. You know, like Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes says, there's there's nothing new under the sun. Um, where where do you see this all headed? I mean, it's it, it's nowhere good. <laughs> Uh, how I, and it, it you know like I said before it just amazes me the exponential growth of all this stuff you know I mean it's it's getting shorter and shorter amount of time where things are getting bigger and bigger and worse and worse and worse I mean when are we going to have to start going underground and you know doing all all, all those things <laughs> Well I, I see some promises in words God, in God's word that's why I added the last three chapters few people realize the strategic significance of 1 John that's probably one of the last books written in the New Testament. That John wrote the Gospel of John. He uh, he then he wrote the Book of Revelation, and I really think that you know this this apostle of love was probably spent many nights agonizing, saying, you know, Lord, I, I showed them how the end was going to be, but I need to give them something to prepare uh, for what's coming. And so then, out of his heart rises up First John, and First John, you know, talks about who Jesus is. Uh, it, it talks, and he begins bringing back the the commandments of God in a very balanced way. Now, I, I know in a lot of parts of the body of Christ that the commandments of God have a very bad rap, and that actually stems back, I think, from some of the Catholic things that are still percolating uh, through the body of Christ. When Constantine began to found his universal religion, he said, "Let us have nothing in common with the Jews," and they they did away with the the, the commandments of God so they could begin implementing their own. Which they still do today. They that, that he that he's infallible. That when he gives a an edict, uh, that it's that if if it contradicts the word of God, then he's right, because he's infallible. And but when we look at the commandments, it's not about being culturally Jewish. It's about being like Jesus. And the Apostle Paul says, listen, if you if you say that you follow Jesus, you're going to manifest it by looking at his commandments and begin incorporating them into the way that you live because the commandments were given so that we could separate what was clean and profane, what originated with the watchers and what originated with God. Uh, the first John is the only book of the Bible that, that actually uses the word antichrist. And so he begins to reveal... Uh, who the Antichrist is, what what his uh, what his tactics, his modus operandi is. Uh, you can even tell if a prophet is is operating by a spirit of Antichrist because uh, he says, "Listen, if if the spirit shows up, you ask it." And I've heard people say, "Well, there's, if an angel shows up, I'm going to ask him, is, has Jesus come in the flesh?'" That's not what he's talking about there because if if you could bring Adolf Hitler here today on your show and say, "Adolf Hitler has Jesus come in the flesh," of course he has. Right. But in, in the context of First John, it is Yahweh, as Yahweh come in the flesh, as Almighty God taken on flesh. 
and walked among us? And did he give his life for us on the cross? And did he die and raise victorious over death, hell, and the grave three days later? Any demonic spirit won't, won't want won't, to want to testify to that. And a false prophet will always lead you away from that, which is the spirit of Antichrist. And he, he goes on to say that even the way that we live our lives in, in, in relation to God's commandments depends upon whether our prayers are, are really effectively answered or not, which I thought was really uh, kind of eye-opening. But what I think what he said there at the end that really got my attention, he said, "If a man keepeth himself, where he was, he was in, in, in the context of what he was talking about by walking in God's ways, because you love God, because of what Jesus has done in your heart, you stop sinning. It's it's not something that you do on purpose. It's something that you do by accident. And when you do it by accident, thank God we have Jesus as, as an advocate for us. But he says, listen, if a man keepeth keeps himself, the wicked one touches him not." And what he, is, what he is really beginning to deal with is the reality that if I begin closing the doors to the enemy in my life and the influence of esotericism that's worldwide and really start praying and getting into the Word of God, I'm going to start getting on fire for God once again. I'm not going to be that Laodicean church that in all my prosperity and in all the things where I thought I was in control and at ease in Zion that I end up being lukewarm, but I'm going to start getting hot for the kingdom of God again, and I'm going to start having that spiritual power on the inside of me. The true remnant always prosper and always thrive during persecution. It's, it's these times of great prosperity that we end up falling asleep. And in fact, years ago when I was in Germany in the military, and this would have been about 19, uh, 1979, I was in Germany, and I got to speak with some people that had, had gotten out of uh, China that were working kind of undercover in China and Russia. And I said, what is, the, what is the one prayer that you guys pray for America? The Christians in America, you know, is it uh, sending you more Bibles? Is it, it is it, you know, sending you more things? And they say, no, we, say, we, we pray that enough persecution would come on the church in America that they would grow up. Wow. Wake up and grow up. And guys, we're just about there. And so we have a decision to make. Either we can go hide ourselves in the bunker with our with our 25-year food, and just hope that the rapture happens before anything gets too bad, and 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 to stick our fingers in our ears and go la 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 la, nothing. You know, I don't have to look at any of this. Or we can hit our knees, we can begin repenting and seeking the face of Almighty God until His presence is so strong in our lives that God can begin using us to be a light in the earth once again that is beyond argument, that is that is that will put down supernatural powers when they come against us because the occult is beginning to rise in power and that darkness is beginning to rise because we have not been shining the way that we should. And it's time for us to return back to the basics and go back to the Word of God and quit arguing with one another and start being busying ourselves about living the things of God and letting God correct us, empower us, and then helping us move forward. Well, I, I love what you're saying, and I could not agree with that more. We need to we need to stop fighting amongst ourselves and act like the body of Christ. You know, we need to stop dismembering the body of Christ. And um <clears throat> I I just I, you know I I could not have I, I could not have said that better my, myself. I really agree with what you're saying, and, and you know we're we're also not given a spirit of fear, but we need to be prepared. That doesn't mean that we just remain in ignorance and we don't bother to look at this stuff, thinking, um, well, you know, God will get me out of it, and and you know he. He will, you know, God, God protects us and stuff, but we still need to be informed. It, you know, I mean, it, it even says that uh, God's people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So we need to know, we need to know what's going on, and um, we need to uh, uh, be able to talk with one another about different ideas, especially on how some of these things might play out, because there's a lot, there's a lot of possibilities. I mean, that's something that we could do an entire show on just on just on that question. Um, but uh, but I but I am curious. How, how do you see all this playing out? Where 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 do you think we're we're headed? What are what are some possibilities that that you can see uh, that might that might unfold? Well, I, I think we're going to have both persecution and revival. Uh, you know, and I mentioned about you know having long-term storage food. That's always a good idea. Uh, it's also a good idea to be able to protect your family with things going around. But we our, our protection has to be threefold. Has to be spiritual. That we're really walking with God, we understand how the kingdom of God operates. We we know how to pray and actually see results when we pray. We we need to learn how to, to renew our minds to the Word of God so that we don't let Babylon influence the way that we think, but we let heaven influence it. And then we physically not only need to do the word but start doing the things to prepare for the days ahead. You know, now would be a good time to stockpile some Bibles, not just not just protein bars. 
to, to be ready not only to give them out, but the, the Word of God may be hard to get, and, you know, in the future we don't know. But I, I think that we need to grow up. There, there are so many things that really are our own traditions that we begin fighting so much in the church about. We, we fight for what we perceive as our uniqueness because we act like we're there's two 7-Elevens on each corner trying to compete with themselves. And one saying, you know, we wear sandals to church, you know, and so we're the sandal-believing Christians. That's what Jesus wore. And then the other side says, no, it's got to be a suit and tie. And you have all, this, all these silly things going on. When in reality, each one of us have a part of the puzzle. Each, right. one of, each one of us have a special gifting. And if we can sit down in love and begin talking with one another, and uh, I heard my, Dr. Michael Heiser say this one statement that really got me thinking. You know, the devil couldn't figure this out the first time around because it, it was so scattered throughout the Word. God had encoded it into the Word. And I, I think in the book of Revelation where you have that silence in heaven for I think it's a half hour, it's so all the prophecy teachers, we all can readjust our charts. <laughs> That's all I know about that. <laughs> but, but he said, he said, he said if, if I was a supernatural evil, evil intelligence, I would use your perception of your eschatology against you. Yeah. And so we really, we really need to understand that maybe we don't have things right so much. We, uh, the prophecy teachers used to, to poo-poo the idea that Israel would ever become a nation again and actually classify men that were teaching it as heretics prior to, to 1948. So maybe we don't have it all right yet, but what we need to do is we need to set down our charts, pick up the Word of God, and, and get on our knees in prayer and say, God, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know exactly how this thing is going to fold out. If the Magog War is going to be at the beginning or the Magog War is going to be at the end, I don't know exactly when the rapture is going to happen. I, I know the, the, the Word of God says that we're going to be caught up together. Is that when, you, when, when we come up in the air and that we meet you uh, before the tribulation, halfway through the tribulation, pre-wrath, uh, I, I would rather be surprised by a pre-trib pre tribulation than to be shocked by a post-trib. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Something I've said a, a bunch of times in, in this show, and I, I've said, uh, you know, I wrote, wrote in my book, I, um, I do believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, but it's, not, it's no excuse to not be prepared for the days ahead. And, you know, I say pray for pre, but prepare for post. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's what uh, Dr. Walter Martin used to say. And, uh, really? I, yeah, and uh, I, I, t I tend to be more pre-wrath, but I just want to go on the air, and, and if the rapture ends up being pre-trib, I'm going to be giving everybody that preached pre-trib high fives on the way up. Okay. <laughs> but, but at the same time, uh, there, were, there, were, there were just as many, if not more, of the early church fathers that believed that the church was going to have to go through the tribulation period to get its act together and be purified. And so we, we don't know, but we, we do know who's in control of tomorrow. We do know who's coming back, Jesus of Nazareth, the, the one that we see in the Bible that is Yahweh Elohim, come in the flesh, is going to come back for his bride that has matured to become his wife. And so we got some maturing to do. And uh, just to be truthful, a lot of the conversations that I see on Facebook don't really show our maturity. It shows our immaturity. Oh, yeah. And, uh, guys, we, we, need, <laughs> we need to straighten up. We need to grow up. And we need to get serious because the, these games that we're playing on whose position is right, we may have gotten away with that 20, 30, 40 years ago. But the thing is that what, what matters now is who's right with him. And I will adjust my life in a fluid manner day after day uh, if, if God's adjusting me and showing me things different and, and trying to adjust some of my thinking to where it lines up with what he's actually doing so that I can be ready for what, what the days that are ahead. And I, I really think your generation is doing that. Uh, I see a lot of the younger generation uh, coming online with a lot of these programs, and you're questioning a lot of the uh, established eschatological positions. Not not in a way of rebellion, but it has to make sense to me, and, and I, I've got to know, and I think we need to openly and honestly have these debates, because although I think we understand some things, I think that um, we don't all have it yet, because some of it's so fluid, because we don't understand the technology that's being developed, we don't understand necessarily the geopolitical things. One of the things that I postulate in, in the, uh, the interpretation of the, the statue that Nimrod saw, Right. That, that both legs may not be Rome. Mm -hmm. That one leg may be Rome and one leg may be 
the Ottoman Empire or Islam. Oh wow! Because you're going to have the 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 Antichrist, which I believe very may well be uh, the Islamic Mahdi mm -hmm. that about in the last days and you're going to have the Pope or, or somebody representing Christianity that's going to be the false prophet following right beside him and then when you, you bring that on down you have not only the, the clay mingled with the iron and the toes which I think can be the watchers and the Nephilim uh, type of thing but when you separate the ten then you have both positions offering a false grace because five is the number of biblical number of grace so they're offering a false grace to mankind Wow so, that, that really makes a lot of sense and I, you know, I'm not saying that. For me, it's not like, "Thus saith the Lord." I know this is exactly the way it is, and if you don't line up, you're gonna go to hell. You know, I'm, <laughs> guys, this may just be a possibility because we never would have imagined, uh, 40, 50 years ago, uh, the rise of Islam, and, and Islam is another esoteric group that that is beginning beginning to give favored status by the elite to create the chaos that they want. Yeah. And, so how much of that is going to be involved in our interpretation? It's more than just Rome. Yeah, I, I agree, and uh, you know that that's something I've researched into. All also is uh, where Islam fits in in end times, and uh, you know I, I think that they definitely have a, a role to play. At, and like you said, at the very least, it's a possibility, and we you know we should be open to consider these possibilities because we don't know which one or a combination of how many is going to end up being the thing. But we do know that there is. Uh, a deception coming. We do know that there's going to be a falling away, that something is coming where uh, people are going to be falling away from the church. And, you know, I, I've, like I said, I, I mean, I've seen it myself in a lot of things, but uh, a big one is this whole ancient astronaut thing. I've seen a lot of people, there, there's something about that that uh, is so convincing with such little evidence <laughs> that uh, people are falling away from the church to go after that. And, um, well, I, I so, believe. I believe the ancient astronauts are the watchers, and Me too. Uh, and so they're they're going to be able to say, you know, we came and we enhanced you that you would have been nothing more than a Neanderthal or an ape, but we came and we tweaked your DNA, and now we're here uh, to take you to the next level so that you can become like us and become like gods. And I really think that uh, one of the things I postulate in the book is that the elite have known this all along, and so they. They did think they have done things over not only centuries but millennia to prepare that the watchers were uh, imprisoned by God for seventy generations, which if you look at it and probably their their um, their when God captured them and, and gave their punishment is probably about uh, three uh, thirty five hundred b c which brings us to about nineteen hundred a d when they were released and so you see the the elite they released two doctrines that transform the world evolution and eugenics right which both play a pivotal role for the transhumanist movement and what the watchers are going to do and so uh, there's even evidence that uh, the Nazi regime was getting their information by trans channeling watchers uh, they were trans channeling aliens or beings from another dimension it, they weren't trying to to get it just get in touch with their their Nordic or whatever uh, past lives as they were, they were they were getting their technology, and they at, they began World War II with the most advanced technology of any nation, and they got that from the Watchers. Uh, then yeah. I also believe that they they were never intended to win the war. That uh, when uh, all all the good scientists, the best scientists, if you will, that were also indoctrinated, they were Nazis. They were using uh, Watcher technologies, were then embedded in all the nations, to say, listen. If you come in league with these beings and begin working with them and allow them to have access to your people, uh, you'll get advanced technology, which is a repeat of Genesis chapter 6. Absolutely. And eventually they're going to show up, and it's going to make every religion on the planet doubt themselves. But what I think is also interesting is the, the worship of the black meteor stones that you see in Mecca, uh, that you even see one time in the Roman Empire, one... Uh, one um, emperor, I forgot what his name was, actually brought one up from further east, that he would worship and parade in the streets of Rome and call it God. Wow. And so there's a connection of these black stones that fell uh, from, sky, from the sky or from another dimension that is being worshipped and is connected in the esoteric societies. And I think, I think it's all going to amalgamate together somehow. 
And uh, I, th I think we're going to be a, most likely alive on Earth and, and begin to see this all come together. Yeah, I mean, we're even we're even starting to see a lot of it now. And um, you know, so I, I wanted to uh, I wanted to ask too. Um, with your book, what you know, we, we've we've covered a lot of topics uh, throughout this show, but for, from beginning to end, what what can people expect when they uh, w when they pick up when they pick up your book? Two things I try to do. I, I try to do it as an intelligence briefing where they can begin to understand the dynamic of the war, and then they begin putting together the pieces of the puzzle throughout history to see how, how we're where we're at now, so that they can begin viewing uh, the things that we see unfolding before us. Uh, with an understanding of how the dynamics of these things work. It's like, once you understand these things, you're never going to see anything on the world stage the same way again. You're going you're to see the, the hands behind the scene that, are, uh, that have turned uh, this into a stage. That it, it's all planned to, to cause a certain response out of us. And once you understand the game, you'll no longer respond that way. You're going to hit your knees and seek the face of God and begin to respond biblically and spiritually the way that you need to instead of just, just becoming a mindless drone that the elite are controlling. Well, it's definitely important. Then, I mean, it's uh, it's something that we all, you know, we all need to be aware of what's going on in our world today, and we all need really need to be aware of how to deal with it uh, spiritually, because that that is what's most important. How how does this uh, how does this affect our walk with God? What what, what do we need to do to uh, continue on in our relationship with God so that we don't become deceived as well? And you know that's why I really appreciate. Uh, researchers and authors such as yourself who write books like this, they're not afraid of the controversy, uh, which, which is good, and uh, to help inform the church and you know, anyone that will listen. Um, if people want to order your book or find out more, more about you, where, where can they go to do that? We, uh, we have a website set up for the book. It's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. Uh, we're going to be posting a lot of other articles and things to support the book and anything dealing with helping prepare the remnant for the end times. Uh, I know there's been a lot of chatter out there about the book. It was originally supposed to come out November 30th, but there was a problem at the printing plant. They were overwhelmed by the end of year Christmas and, and holiday season printing, and so it has been it has been out of stock on Amazon since November 30th. Uh, the reality is, it's not going to be released until the 15th of January this year. So we just got a few days to wait. All right, excellent. Uh, is there anything else that we haven't covered that that uh, that you want to cover before before we close out the show, or any final thoughts, anything like that? I want to give you the last part of the show to uh, just talk about whatever whatever's in your heart. <laughs> you know, we can talk a lot about end times and and how this is necessarily going to play out, and we can all speculate because we're we're all seeing through a glass darkly. But something that we do see clearly is who Jesus is. What we see clearly is what God has given us as instruction in the Word and how God is calling us to return back to a life of publicity, of not living by the doctrines of men or necessarily what, what our churches have done and how that's been amalgamated and maybe even infiltrated by the elite, but opening back up the Word of God and letting Scripture interpret Scripture and allowing the Holy Spirit to show us how to begin living a dynamic faith that is real, learning how to walk in the authority that we have in Christ, and I, I tell people when they start learning their authority, the first one they need to learn have authority over is themselves. If you can get you under control in the name of Jesus, then you can begin, can, then you can begin binding demons on the outside and taking authority on the outside and, and then begin exercising authority in our families. I think that uh, the family unit and making the family a place of learning and prayer and spiritual warfare is essential. Don't do it all at church. It's got to be done from the home. Uh, one of the things the rabbis have taught for uh, millennia is why did God start the Word of God in Genesis 1-1? Why did it start with a bet, which is the second letter of the alphabet, instead of an aleph? Because aleph represents one. God is one. It calls, talks about power. Why did he start with a bet? Bet a sheet. It's because he was building a house. He was building a house for his family. And it's always been about a house, and it's always been about family, and it's always been about God being interactive in the household. And I think God is calling us in this generation to bring spirituality back into the home, to bring the Word of God back into the home, to bring prayer back into the home, to bring worship back into the home. If we can get our homes right, we'll see a change around in our churches. And if we can see a change around in our churches, we're going to begin affecting society with the power of God today. 
Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. And very well said. And, you know, I, I really agree with that last part that you said. It starts in the home. You know, it, it starts with us as individuals, spreads out to our family, then our communities, and, and then the nations. Uh, you know, I think a lot of times the, the the church or, you know, us as Christians, we look at the world and it's such a mess and we just think that it's hopeless. And so we just try to ride it out until, you know, either we die or if, if we or the rapture or, you know, whatever. And, you know, instead of looking at it on the macro level, if we look at it in the micro level, our, our own selves, where can we change? How can how can we better um, walk with God to, to get through some of this stuff? If everybody did that, the church would be an unstoppable force, and we'd all get along. <laughs> and wouldn't that be great? God's been dealing with me a lot here lately about getting out of survival mode. Uh, now is not the time to lay down the vision. Now is the time to get a fresh new vision from God of the way He wants us. Not uh, Who cares about the world right now? If we get us right, if we get the salt right, the salt is going to affect what it has been scattered out into, but we can't lose our savor. We, we've got to become salty once again to, make, to be a preserva preser preserving force in the earth. I couldn't agree with you more. Absolutely. Uh, well, I, I, you know, unfortunately, it looks like we are all just about out of time. But uh, this, this could just go on and on. <laughs> uh, it's been such a pleasure having you on the show. I, I can't thank you enough for uh, taking the time out of your busy schedule to, um, to come on the show and do this. It's, uh, it, it, it's been great having you on. We'll definitely have to do this again. Well, I want to thank you for the privilege of being on your show, and and probably one of the ones I've enjoyed the most in here in quite a while. So. Uh, you're doing a great job for the kingdom of God. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. It means a lot, and uh, and you are too. You know, I, I love your book. I, I love your message. I, everything you've you've uh, said on this show, I can get behind a hundred percent. And uh, you know, it, it's it's one of the biggest blessings of doing this show is being able to meet and and connect with like-minded uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, you know, it's something that. I, I love most about doing this and getting to learn other perspectives because that's that's a uh, since day one that's been a big thing on this show is uh you know if somebody can back it up with scripture and you know as long as it goes along with the word of God let, let's let's see what people have to say and um uh like what we were talking about before let's explore uh, possibilities that might come to pass it's we need to be prepared for that um. So uh, uh, you know, again, I can't uh, I can't thank you enough for for providing your perspective and and sharing with us. <laughs> uh, so that's that's awesome. Well, uh, again, I can't thank you enough. We'll we'll do this again. We'll keep in touch and uh, you know, take care and God bless. God bless, brother. All right. Well, that again was Michael K. Lake talking with us about his book, The Shine Our Directive. Preparing the Way for the Son of Perdition. Make sure to check out his materials. He has uh, a lot out there to learn from. I know I, I certainly have learned a lot. If you would like to find more episodes of The Sharpening, you can do so at ministry.com and my YouTube channel, youtube.com backslash Josh Peck Disclosure. Uh, also, if you care to help support for Mini Study Ministry, uh, you can do so at ministry.com. Your donations go to the everyday running of Mini Study Ministry and uh, help you bring more episodes of the sharpening as well as more books and, and other materials. Uh, I will say, uh, and, and I can't overstate this enough, please only donate if you feel God leading you to do so. If you're not sure or if you don't feel led to, then don't donate. Just we can always use more prayer. Uh, pray for us. A lot of times that's more effective anyway. Um, also, uh, we're talking about donations, we're not 501c3, so your donations aren't uh, tax deductible. And uh, and I'm never going to be the kind of person that will promise you extra blessings from God or a miraculous tenfold return of your money or anything like that. We're not in the business of making promises for God. But what I can promise you is that you're... Uh, is that your your help, it, be it prayer or financial, it's greatly appreciated. It, it goes to the, um, it keeps us going, and it, it, it's the only reason that we're able to continue doing what we do. Uh, so that's about all I can really say about that. Uh, I want to thank you so much for tuning into The Sharpening. I am your host, Josh Peck, and as always, take care and God bless.